Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back from lunch. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our, our final speakers for today, uh, Irina and Amy, uh, longtime friends of the EdCog conference. And I've actually known each of them since they were undergrads. Uh, they were teaching assistants in my introductory psychology class, and look at them now. Uh, so Irina is now um, a teaching experience, experience learning, designer. learning experience designer, and Close. Amy is an educational uh, developer. Uh, so they now teach others how to teach uh, effectively. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to their talk today. Um, one of the, um, the icebreakers that uh, sometimes I use in my class is uh, I get people to pair up and try to find the most unusual thing that they have in common which actually leads to some interesting discussions. Oh, no. And um, the most interesting thing that's, that you two have in common that's sort of unusual, maybe you didn't even realize, is um, they both like to collect handwritten, thoughtfully worded <laughs> thank you notes, which is very unusual. That's what you two have in common. It's true. Yeah. The one thing. Yeah. So, they, uh, so Irina and Amy. So bad. I was way more nervous about Joe's introduction when I realized that there will be introductions. So welcome everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunches. I hope it was a good experience. And if you have any feedback, we'll appreciate to hear that afterwards. But as Joe mentioned, I'm Irina Gillick. I work as a learning experience designer. I feel like I'm still a recovering grad student and a design and infographic enthusiast. And my name is Amy Pachai. I am an educational developer. We both work for the Teaching and Learning Services team at DeGroot School of Business here at McMaster University. Um, we do want to take a second. I know the conference did a broader um, uh, land acknowledgement, but it is an important part of our uh, teaching experience that we take a moment to reflect on where we're joining from. Uh, we know that we also have some folks joining remotely. so. We are gratefully gathered here on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Mississauga, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabek, and Adirondack peoples. Um, we also want to encourage you not just to recognize and acknowledge the land that you are on, but also to, um, to review the calls to action, the report uh, by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, and to support the Indigenous communities and act as stewards of the land uh, so that we can continue to carry forward the beautiful space that we are on right now. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pass it to Irina. I'm going to be doing the first half, Amy will be doing the second half, and then we will take questions together. Now, I do want to start by just quickly polling the audience, just a very quick for us to get an idea. We have the cutting edge technology today of raising our hands. So by a show of hands, could I please have those, raise your hands if you're working mostly in a non-teaching role. So teaching is not a full-time thing that you do, even if you do it on the side hustle. All right, thank you. You can see the people around you who are working in a non, so now who is working in a mainly teaching role? Excellent, it's always lovely to see this mix. And while um, if you need more advanced audience response systems than what we did today, I do encourage you to talk to our top hat reps that are outside and happy to give you information on how to introduce audience response systems to your classroom that are not just raising your hands. So now while Amy and I both have had teaching roles and still sometimes do on the side, as I said, it's not side hustles, we mainly work with faculty and staff in developing learning experiences and in what I would like to call the backstage of education. So just like you have tech crew and stage crew props and wardrobe, I am here to ensure and we're here to ensure that those in a more learner presenting role are the heroes of those learner stories. We're not necessarily in the spotlight, except for when we come to conferences and talk about it. So as experienced designers, we usually have a motto of good experiences and great experiences don't just happen accidentally. 
So even trying to think about, you know, you've had a great experience going to a concert or a restaurant or attending a conference. What made that experience great? Was it that it was so fluent and easy and you had engagement and you remember some great things for it? Well, all of those might seem nice as you're going through it and it's so fluid, but they require a lot of intentionality. And we usually have a multifaceted approach to any educational opportunities that we come across. We approach creative problem solving on what we've learned as our careers as learning experience designers, so LXD, you'll see it there, or as educational developers, instructional assistants, instructional developers, so many different roles that we can name, but also in our role as teachers, sessional instructors, teaching assistants, and with our background of research and researchers. And to give you an overview of what disciplines are foundational to this field of learning experience design, let's just quickly look at this graphic. So you'll see that in essence, learning experience design is a combination of two main domains. So we have experience here in the middle, and there's learning and there's design. Of course, things are not always that easy. So if you think about an experience, is it more human driven or is it more goal oriented? And that's how we get a few quadrants of more human-centered design. So you can think of interaction design or user experience, applied game design. Is it more goal-oriented design, <laughs> like having game design, graphic design? And then we get into these quadrants that might be most familiar with the people we have, in today, we have today, where we have the human and learning combination in the theory of learning, and then the learning and the goals in the putting learning into practice. So what is really learning the spirit design? How is it different to different names that you might have heard, like educational development, instructional assistance, UX, so user experience? Well, learning experience design is really a framework. It's a way of developing educational experiences while focusing on the needs of the learner. So it's really through a holistic approach, we're thinking about meeting the needs of our learners by combining cognitive science, user experience design, thinking about the learning environment, thinking about accessibility, inclusive design, and so many different things that our learners bring because the focus, at least for us, is where it should be, on the learner and what they're experiencing and the process that they are going through. However, we do want to also not forget about everyone else involved in the experience. So a learning experience is really designed for also all of those who participate in the experience, not just the learner by themselves. So we also really care when we're working with our instructors, with our staff, for them to also get a great experience out of their teaching, out of the workshop they're giving, out of that class, so that everyone kind of leaves with different memorable points from the experience. So you'll see this graphic here, and I'll try not to talk too quickly. I had coffee instead of lunch, so I have sparkling anxiety now. Um, I should have had food. <laughs> but if we look, so do let me know, like, slow down, lady, uh, if I'm going too quickly. But if we look at this process, you know, for at the beginning when we are encounter with some sort of opportunity or a challenge or a problem, we have a question that we want to ask. We then research it. We... Uh, try to think of a design, we build that design, we might prototype it, we test it out, see how it works, and maybe it needs more work. So we're going back in that wheel until we can finally launch that experience. And that's why our process includes so much time getting into the brains of our learners. What are their needs? What motivates them? What are the desired goals of that experience? And how do we keep them engaged? And where some roles might employ more of a top-down approach to teaching, learning experience design really grows from the bottom up. Because not all learning solutions are the same and not all of them are created equal. So knowing how and why learning sticks and suggesting appropriate solutions with various cognitive considerations is a big part of LXD. So for example, you know, good LXD, if you think about it in the industry and from some of our experience in the industry, is a big part of employees' performance in a workplace scenario. So a well-designed learning or digital learning can improve the employee's performance. They can 
have an increased their retention and might even have, of course, revenue benefits, which is sometimes what industry might be more focused on. And okay, let's get to what are some of those cognitive science lessons that we consider. And you'll see that some of these categories, they might seem a bit broader because they do kind of take lessons and learnings from different parts of research. And we would love to talk about any and all of those pieces uh, at any time after this talk if we don't get to really delve uh, deeply into all of them. One of them, which I really love that's come out through the themes of the conference, is learner motivation. So when students are highly motivated, they can tackle more challenges than maybe they wouldn't have tackled if that motivation wasn't there. However, there's no right way or a recipe to motivate students. Rather, it's really important to encourage that motivation through some autonomy, through goal setting, and providing positive feedback that focuses on the tasks that they have to do, the learning process, and probably some of the self-regulation as well. Now, our students enter the classrooms as human beings, as human beings with multiple experiences. They have a life, as do we sometimes, outside of the classroom. They're humans first with whatever might happen. And I feel like going through the pandemic has maybe given us a bit more of an empathetic approach and view on how we view our learners. So they're coming in from various cultures and they have different traits. So personalization, adaptation of your, instructor, or your instructions and assessments can positively affect them. So for example, and we are drawing from some background liter literature, not going through all of them, um, they can adapt by choosing, for example, choosing their own adventure and how they're doing something, a personalized dashboard, and also maybe getting feedback for them to adapt the learning to their needs. We have covered retrieval practice quite a bit, and we've talked about it, but thinking about ways in which testing can strengthen students' memories of that retrieve information, Another example that maybe hasn't come up a lot today, or maybe I didn't catch it at the end of the questions, think of immediate feedback on assessments, introducing something like that at the end of a test or a quiz and having that immediate feedback that they can learn from. Experiential learning is a big topic right now. I feel like it's a big topic right now in education, just as I remember 10, 15 years ago, problem-based learning was a big topic, but they all kind of tackle the same root concept, kind of like retrieval practice as well, it cognitively engages or stimulates their participants. So for this one, and just pulling from many different references and resources and experiential learning, um, I do have a list that I don't want to forget things from. So it leads to growth. And here are some of the things that from many studies on different types of experiential learning, you know, your learners can have better conceptual understanding of the material, retention of knowledge, transfer of knowledge to new problems, more engagement, um, attitudes and perceived usefulness of subjects, more self-directed learning, exam performance, motivation, and again, autonomy. I think you'll notice a few kind of trends going throughout this in terms of how we think about our learners, how we get into their brains, autonomy being one of them. So then that kind of goes hand in hand in interactivity and co-creation. We love co-creating with our learners. When students are able to take kind of an active role in the discussion, choose their own topics, ask questions, they get to co-construct that knowledge and engage with us. And an interesting study has looked at how when, you know, instructors work with their learners and work with students, it also reduces kind of that transactional distance that we have sometimes in our work. So thereby increasing some of that student retention. Instead of that, I give you content and you somehow you learn and give it back, but we're working together. And also definitely not forgetting in our roles, the role of metacognition and self-regulation. So models of self-regulated learning describe it as, you know, we're monitoring progress towards, we set a goal, we monitor progress towards that goal, and then we kind of self-regulate or control or try to check in to see, have we achieved that goal? And you can imagine if someone is not employing some uh, accurate self-regulation metacognition, they might spend a lot more time studying things, trying to learn things that they already know um, and not spending enough time on things that are yet to be learned. 
So thinking about metacognition and self-regulation gives us the opportunity to um, explore new problems and explore different approaches on how we might help our learners with some of that self-regulation in what we do. And now these cognitive science lessons that we have can be implemented in countless ways at any point in the learning experience design process. So learning experience designers consider more of a before, a during, and an after approach. So in the before of this pathway, we usually ask, okay, how might we build some anticipation? So think about if you are going to experience anything, if you're going to go to the movies. If you're not like me, you might like to watch a trailer. I don't like spoilers. But you might watch a trailer. You might get excited about it. And then you're experiencing that. That movie was great. And then afterwards, there might not be a lot to do about the movie itself. But think of movie theaters. There's fun stuff to do hanging around after a movie. There's different coffee shops or places around that you can do after that experience, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So how might you build that anticipation? If you're going to a concert, you know, releases of song, even a restaurant, one of the best ways that I build anticipation is by looking at the menu and getting excited, seeing pictures of the food and getting excited about the experience. So in thinking about our course now, learners, like how do we build anticipation for the students? Do we expect them to come in and be like, I will love this class when they just saw the syllabus this morning? So how can we do some of that? How might we encourage and sustain their participation during? So there's multiple ways to do it. I know Amy will delve into some of that, but you know, even just engaging with the audiences and thinking about how do you engage during that experience? What are the different touch points that you are mapping out in this experience? Because you can look at it as, you know, if you do have a lecture or workshop, 50 minutes, I'm going to do this. Well, what about dividing it into different points and different touch points that you know you can engage with them and sustain that participation? And I, I like the restaurant example, also maybe because I'm hungry now. Uh, but you know, you get a little appetizer at first and then you get your main meal and the server might say like, oh, would you like some dessert? And like, I could never, but yes, please. So you're kind of constantly being sustained by being offered these opportunities. And after, what happens after? And I love that I heard today throughout the talks and maybe in the answers of the question that learning is a process. So if learning is a process, our development of it is a process as well. So what are the students doing after that? And aside of thinking of, you know, they have homework, they have things to do, how might we connect and prompt reflection for them? How might we prompt connections to topics? And I know Carl had mentioned, you know, it might be more difficult in, to do that in some subjects than others, like statistics, you know, like I don't look at things around my kitchen, I'm like, mm, let's calculate a t-test. So, but trying to think about, okay, what points of connections can they have? So to give the example of retrieval practice, because I did look ahead at the program, like, oh, this is a good one. People are talking about it. How might you build anticipation? Sure, people are not like, yay, tests. But you can build some of that anticipation for topics that are going to come up by doing a pretest. And there's lots of body of lit literature on the advantages of having a pretest and kind of showing that concept. And so just th this, just from a cognitive principle perspective, because there are lots of ways to build anticipation for your topics themselves. During, well, during an experience, we might have some knowledge checks throughout. If it's in a classroom, you know, you might use something like an audience response system. I don't work for them, I swear. I just really like them. Um, you can do the raise your hands, you can, you can check in with your students, and that also helps with their self-regulation. It helps with some of that regulating their learning, like, oh, I didn't know that knowledge check. Maybe I should go, oops, sorry, maybe I should go back. And this is especially important when they're doing online learning and they're by their, themselves. How might we encourage some of that regulation learning through something like knowledge checks through retrieval practice? And afterwards, you know, using questions like flashcard model or different types of questions that may interleave various concepts that they have to connect and learning throughout and asking the learners to make connections and transfer that to their learning scenarios. So that's just by looking at one certain model. 
There are, however, so many considerations and so many questions to ask when bringing these cognitive science lessons into our learning and design frameworks and directly trying to apply them in our classrooms and in our curriculum, and most especially for our learners. Because uh, we're going back to that original thing of thinking about how we're getting to our learners' brains, how might we apply these, and there's a multitude of ways in which we can apply them. And I did also like the comment earlier of, you know, are we gonna have everything in every course? Well, our usual answer is no, not necessarily, depending what is the content, who are our learners, what are they trying to learn? Especially throughout the solutions for online learning, throwing every single technology is not the best for every experience. Sometimes no technology is the best for that experience. So how might we map these out and ask more questions as we're trying to introduce them? So Amy, how might we do that? I'm gonna try to match Irina's energy. Wish me luck. <laughs> so we know that the reality of taking cognitive science into the classroom is extremely complicated. There are so many factors that affect the way these things are implemented. We have to use our discretion as educators. We have to spend time understanding our learners. And honestly, it takes a lot of courage to try something new. Um, so to highlight what this might look like, we're gonna walk through a case study from our professional experience. So let me set the stage a little, the pun intended, no, you know. Um, the backstage for this is that we work uh, for the business school. One of the programs that we work on is our MBA program. It intakes uh, about 200 students every September, and most of those students are in the co-op stream. So this means that they start in September, they do a semester of academics, and then they go out on a co-op term in the winter. So basically, the minute they step foot on our campus, they are starting co-op job search. Uh, so there are so many different kinds of students that are entering this program. They're coming from all different fields. And when they're coming here, we have, to, um, we have to level the playing field a little bit. We have to build the skill set really quickly in this group of students. Um, so what we, are, what we worked on in this case study is we worked on an online career launch course that would run in August to get all of the students up to speed so that they can start their job search in September. So how did we use these frameworks, this before, during, after framework, and some of these cognitive science principles in order to tackle this course? We were aiming to build anticipation, to sustain participation, and encourage reflection. So where did we start this journey? What are the goals for the course? Who are the stakeholders? When we're doing research in the lab, which Irina and I both did our PhDs in sort of education and cognition, we don't always have to focus on what the practicalities of implementation might mean. So this was alluded to a little bit in some of the other talks, right? We start in sort of a basic cognitive, um, in the basic cognitive principles, doing basic cognition research. And somehow, eventually, we build incrementally until we have to take the leap of faith and bring it into the classroom. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to impact learning here. So in this context, we do have to zoom out a little bit from the specifics of how do we control everything. The reality is, that you cannot. You can have everything perfectly aligned. You can know what works, you know, 10 out of 10 times in the lab, and then you bring it into the classroom and the sound is weird and there's a whirring that's happening over there. And the person sitting in front of you has been on Instagram looking at their Instagram ads and online shopping the entire time. They might be looking at the menu for dinner tonight. Right? There are so many things that are happening that you cannot possibly control. So I really do think about it as a little bit of a leap of faith, right? We have to dive in. 
So in this context, we're thinking about how does this fit into the broader curricula? What are the tangible learning goals we really actually need them to know? Not the nice to haves. Of course, I want everybody in my learning experience to learn and pick up every single thing that I talk about. But the reality is that when you ask students or learners after a course, what do you remember from that course? If they can tell me one or two things, I kind of nailed it as an instructor, right? They're, they're taking so many different courses at once that we, you know, we have to give them a little bit of grace. Um, we also have to think about who are the stakeholders? What are the resources available to support this endeavor? Are there TAs? Are there instructional assistants? Is there a teaching team? Are there multiple instructors? How much time does everyone have to devote to this process? Um, we work with instructors who are very stretched for time. And I know some of you in the audience are probably feeling the same way, where somebody might come to you and say, hey, I have a really great idea for how to completely change your course. And alarm bells start going off. So when am I going to do that? Because changes that you're implementing don't just happen. Every hour that you're in front of a class, is many hours of prep time beforehand, just like we assume our students are spending hours outside of class learning, we as instructors are also doing that. So we have to be really realistic with this. So one of the ways that we sort of tackle this uncertainty in the learning experience design process is we use things like discovery questions. So every time we start a new educational development project or we start trying to make some kind of change, we take at least a little bit of time at the beginning to lay it all out together and say, what are we trying to do? What are the challenges that we're facing? What are the pain points? What's your favorite thing to teach? What is your best class? And we all kind of have one, right? We all have a favorite thing that we do and something that like, we kind of dread every semester. And we want to know that because it's really valuable information in terms of where we can target our efforts. The other process that we use a lot is the concept of empathy mapping. So for those of you who aren't familiar, empathy mapping we focus on, for example, the group of students that are entering this career launch course, our MBA students. And we take the time with everybody involved to think about what are these learners feeling? A weird thing for a cog sci conference to talk about. What are they feeling? What are they thinking about in there? What are they actually doing? Not what we want them to do. What are they actually doing? What are they saying? And we use this to understand our learners, not the ideal version, but the real students who are coming into the class. This can help us understand our learners and our facilitators. So understanding the context is a very important first step. The next thing that we tackled in a project like this is sort of situating our learning outcomes in this context. So we have to take stock of what already exists. We have to flesh out what the content is that needs to happen. We're thinking about how it fits into the curriculum. Um, most importantly, we start to consider how are these learning outcomes actually going to be addressed and covered. So sometimes when we create learning outcomes, we'll say something like, by the end of this lecture, you're going to know what learning experience design is. That's not enough to build out an effective experience. We need to know how you're going to learn that. What pieces of it are important? Why do you need to learn that? So sort of fleshing out those other pieces of our learning outcomes. And this is also the point in that space where we really think about how we're going to motivate our students. This can help us, what can help us here is the before, during, after framework. So beforehand, building anticipation is a really great motivating factor for students. 
looking at the menu ahead of time, you start building up a little bit of an appetite, right? If they know what's coming to them, they can prepare and get excited about it. Um, now, let's build out an experience that applies cognitive science where we can. So, what cognitive science lessons did we inject into this experience? Retrieval practice is admittedly one of those low-hanging fruit. That's pretty easy to put into a learning experience. Irina had a number of really great examples before, during, and after that we can use, right? So beforehand, you can do things like pre-testing. And there is a wonderful body of literature about how that's really beneficial to students. It helps to situate their learning. It can build anticipation, build motivation, get them excited. It also is very useful as, for you as an instructor. If you have some sense of where your students are at to begin with, that's going to help you know how to tailor what you do moving forward. Um, we also implement things like, we, we don't call them interpolated testing, sorry, Carl. We call them knowledge checks because interpolated testing is a little bit scary for our learners. <laughs> we call them knowledge checkpoints. So we will present to you a video, a reading, and we'll just ask, uh, it could be a reflective prompt, it could be a multiple choice question, something that helps them just think about why did this matter to you? What was interesting about that? And asking questions that are a little bit feelings-based is actually a really helpful thing for students to tap into that self-regulation and metacognition that Irina was talking about. Um, so how does this fit into your own experiences? We would ask, um, in this course, we have to teach things like resumes and cover letters, interview skills, how do you do personal branding? And so asking them a prompt after you teach them about personal branding that says, who do you think has a strong personal brand? Who comes to mind when you think about that? Is it a good example? Is it a not so good example? Um, do you value their personal brand? Do you think it's a strong brand? Would you want to implement something like that? Just those reflective prompts gives a lot for students to work with when they're talking about, when they're thinking about that material. Um, we also did things like adaptive learning, which for us looked like setting what's called release conditions. So in our course here, that is our case study, we have things that say, you can't access certain parts of this course until you've completed other things and it may branch off at different points. So some of our students are really interested in looking for marketing jobs, and some people want to do consulting, and some people are going to get their CPA, and they're going to be accountants. And the examples we provide sort of stream them towards that so that they're able to adapt and get the most out of the learning situation for their specific context. We have lots of interactivity and co-creation. So one of the fun things in a course like this is we learn how to do elevator pitches. Can you talk about what you do and who you are for two minutes max? And one of the tasks in this is that they have to record their own elevator pitch. These are shared with other students. And so you can see uh, your peers' elevator pitches. It helps you get to know and build connections with those students inspire something that you might want to implement in your own elevator pitch. And then, selfishly, as an instructional team, we can use some of those elevator pitches in the next time we run this course as examples for our future students so that the examples we're using are constantly evolving. We're really co-creating what is being shared with cohorts of students. Um, and that keeps a course fresh, interesting, engaging, motivating. When you get an elevator pitch from somebody who got their job 15 years ago, the things they talk about aren't exactly going to be the same things as our new MBA graduates. So this helps keep it fresh. 
We also have things like uh, reflection prompts, personalized coaching to help with that metacognition piece. Um, and of course, multimedia principles are an important part of the way we create our slides, our videos, all of those pieces. And there is a vast literature on the best ways to implement uh, strong multimedia principles for effective learning. So we can talk about that if we'd like to a little bit later. Um, okay, implementing large-scale changes. It is a huge undertaking, as some folks in this room know. One way to tackle this is to consider incremental change. Like Irina alluded to, do we want to do everything in this course? Do we want to start putting in you know, all of these knowledge checkpoints and we'll have interpolated testing in all of our live lectures and you know, they'll have a quiz every single week and, and we'll have all of these pieces, the very, you know, it's gonna go from three hours of lecturing at you one semester to all in, you know, let's go, we're gonna test everything. And I think one of the questions uh, in the previous talk around, maybe that's good for helping the learning in that specific course, but are we doing a disservice to the other courses these students are participating in, right? Are we taxing them to the point where they're not actually able to engage in learning outside of that, that course because they've been sort of burnt out? So we have to think about it from that learner perspective, but also from the instructor perspective. If any of you have made changes to a course semester over semester, um, it's one, a lot of work. It also almost never goes exactly the way you thought it was gonna go. So if you're going to change everything at once, first of all, we won't actually know which of those things worked, if any, and something's likely to go off the rails a little bit. So we wanna take, you know, bite-sized chunks at this endeavor. Um, so for example, in the career launch course that we worked on, we created the first module of this course, which was on personal branding. Um, and we provided that to all of our stakeholders, which included the teaching team. It included past students who had been through it, alumni. Um, and we had them go through it and provide us feedback on that first piece. Before we dove in and tried to do the rest of it, this made it a lot more reasonable for us as the folks who were, um, who were engaging in this work. And it also really shaped the way we moved forward after that. So incremental change is extremely important. Um, and the last thing uh, in this step, in this process that I was gonna talk about is sort of feedback. So this is one of the pieces of feedback that we received on previous iterations of the course. So getting interviews about personal branding experiences were interesting and useful. I could apply that knowledge to my own personal branding. So we were a little worried about those uh, customized examples, like the marketing example, accounting, consulting, all of these different fields providing that because there can be a fear as instructors um, or instructional assistants, educational developers, that we're gonna overwhelm our students. Yes, it's nice to have all of these options for them, but what if we drown them in it by accident? <laughs> what if they look at it and they say, whoa, that's way too much. Like, I, I don't even know where to get started. I can't do this. But getting feedback like this actually showed us that putting the work into getting those sort of specific examples um, was not only worth that effort, it, it helped provide and ground it for students in a really unique way. And so it was worth the work and it didn't backfire in the way that we were worried about that it might intimidate them. And so collecting feedback was really useful for us that, um, that this is one of the lessons that stuck with the students the most. Um, even though it was technically extra work in the course. These were optional examples that they could look at. Um, but it was, this was the answer to the question, what do you think is the most important thing to keep in this course next time we run it? 
and it was actually this optional piece. So that's really useful information to us. So arguably, the most important part of any learning experience design and redesign is uh, feedback collection. And as scientists, we can't really expect to learn about what's working um, and how it's why it, and how or why it's working if we don't collect some data. Now, data is an interesting thing to think about, and I won't get too much into it, but data, collecting data and feedback can look so many different ways. Qualitative data from our students, quotes like this, are extremely useful in shaping what we do in our courses. Um, yes, it's nice to have quantitative data about things, but it doesn't always capture the complexity of a learning experience. So a balance of the different types of questions are really important when you're actually soliciting feedback from students. Okay, we've only got a couple minutes, so I'm just gonna wrap it up really quick. Uh, these are some of the lessons uh, that we want to leave you with here. When you're trying to implement cognitive science principles into your learning experience design. So you've just sat through a conference that has taught you, hopefully, a lot of interesting things that you might want to try out. Now, when you go to do that, don't feel like you have to tackle everything at once. Incremental change is not only okay, it is actually encouraged. That's the best way for this to work for you and for your learners. Work with your learners. Can you co-create things? How can they shape the experience with you? Your learners may produce thoughtful content or ideas that can be integrated into future iterations of your experience. For example, those elevator pitches that we have them do that we're going to be able to use year over year and update. Um, work smarter, not harder. So what is already available in your learning management system? What is already institutionally supported? So we are actually Lucky at DeGroote, all of our faculty have access to Top Hat, shout out. Um, and, and so they don't, they don't have to go through the process of, uh, of figuring out what possible tools there are and weighing it all up. We've got one. Use it, right? The, the learning curve is pretty, like, pretty minimal. Every, all your, your peers are using it. That's great. Um, What's included in your textbook? Are there questions or interaction points that are included with your textbook bank? Um, what technologies are your, is your department using so that you don't have to teach your students a whole new technology if it's being used by other faculty in that department? So that can also be really helpful. Um, and then prioritizing continuous improvement, um, collecting feedback throughout, not just your course evals at the end of the semester. We do a process uh, that we call course refinements, where we come in and um, collect feedback about a third of the way into a course, um, because then they've got a sense of it and they can provide us really useful feedback while they're in the moment. Students are much more likely to give you useful feedback at that point because it will benefit them. When they give you feedback at the end of the semester, they're probably never going to see you again. So it benefits the future cohorts, which, of course, there are lots of students who are going to provide feedback there. But the feedback can be very thoughtful and very tangible when you collect it earlier in the experience. So promote, I, I, we encourage you to, uh, to engage in a continuous improvement process. So. Thank you so much to our collaborators on everything, the entire teaching and learning services team at DeGroote, the MBA career and professional development team that we worked on this case study with, all of the conference organizers, especially my co-presenter, Irina. She is amazing. <laughs> and you. <laughs> yeah, I, we promised that I would thank her and she would thank me because we're not working in a lab anymore, so we don't have like funding agencies to thank. So. <laughs> um, and we are so happy to answer any questions, comments, uh, or ideas you might have. Thank you so much. I have one question for you uh, off the top of my head. So 
the type of people that come to a conference like this, they're, they're the people that believe in teaching. And, um, but I imagine you have to work with a variety of faculty members. We certainly do. Yeah, and so do. I'd like to hear your actual experiences without naming names. Oh, of course. Um, okay. What it's actually like to work with various types of faculty members, those that need help and may not even realize that they mm -hmm. need help. And you, can you speculate on their mindset? Yeah. Whether it's fixed or, <laughs> <laughs> okay. or growth. Do you mind if I start? Please, please okay, do. Okay, so I will start by saying, you know, we are lucky in a teaching and learning services team that we do have the people come to us. Those who are interested in making some changes. And you know, some people will never be interested in making changes. Some instructors are happy with how things go, and in a way, that's okay, we can't force them. But uh, I'll share my experience, because I started a bit after Amy, I started especially in the School of Business, and I, I won't name names, but coming in with some industry experience and some of these concepts, I, I think people were looking at me a little bit weirdly at first, uh, and the concepts that I was bringing in, but once you start working and also meeting them and the instructors where they're at and hearing out their motivations, their needs, uh, listening to what could they do, what they already have, and asking, as Amy said, those kind of discovery-based questions that we ask in a creative problem-solving type of capacity is already maybe starting to provide some ideas and solution within that meeting. So something that we ensure that we do is if we're meeting for an hour, you might have some ideas by the time we get to the end of it. And I, I, especially for me starting out, and I started during the pandemic and online learning and e-learning, that was new for lots of folks. I think word of mouth was also, sorry, my earrings are clinking. Uh, I think word of mouth was also really good. So at some point working with some instructors that maybe haven't worked with us and, and we went together through this kind of experience, having some sessions within the department for peer sharing. So have putting on together some opportunities where some instructors can talk with their other peers of instructors of what they did and how it was successful and why it was successful. Amy? Absolutely. So faculty instructors like to hear from their peers, and that is a really useful tool. The other thing that I would say is framing really open questions can help to get at what the pain points actually mm -hmm. are. The reality in academia is that we are all a little bit overworked. We're all a little bit stretched thin. You go into a meeting with somebody and you say, what is, like, what's your biggest challenge right now? Even if we're not saying we can fix it, we're not coming in with the pitch, we're going we're gonna to get to the bottom of that, but just say, what's the hardest thing about teaching right now? I promise you, they'll answer it. Right? People love to share that kind of experience. There's, you know, there's a camaraderie and kind of, you know, complaining a little bit <laughs> about the challenges of this thing. That if you do that, you can start to build that rapport and say, hey, that thing that's really tough for you, I've got a little, I've got a little idea. Why don't we try this, this little thing that might move you in the direction we want? So yeah, it's, it's tough, but you know, it, it is, um, it's exciting work. I have a faculty member, I'm so sorry, I have a faculty member who uh, was using um, old technology for quite a long time, and I finally got him to move to Zoom before the pandemic, <laughs> moved to Zoom before the pandemic, and he was overjoyed. He was like, oh, this is going to take me through the rest of my teaching career. Like, I feel like I... I feel like I'm like new on the block and I, I've, I've got it. Like I'm, and that's really empowering and really exciting. So even, you know, everybody's got things that they want to learn. Yeah, and even instructors don't always know what they don't know about the opportunities that are out there for that, some of that incremental change. And I think we have a question at yeah, the back absolutely. there. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm really still curious, I'm so curious about what you're doing because a lot of times we have people who are content experts mm -hmm. in, in their thing, and so you're coming along as someone who's maybe not a content, a content expert. So I'm just curious, what are some of the strategies that you have found helpful in building trust or connection so that 
that content expert is now willing to or engaging with you mm -hmm. in order to become more engaging in the classroom. Absolutely. Rapport building is the biggest part of our job, honestly, because we're not in front of the class. Yeah. So uh, we can talk to you about what we think is going to work, but the reality is that they can come to the front of the class and do whatever they want anyway, right? <laughs> so you really have to build that trust. One of the ways that I think works really well is to um, spend a little bit of time talking to them about what the strengths of their teaching are, right? So you do a little bit of, you know, what's, what's really working for you? Why do you do that thing? If they have strong feelings about it, absolutely, we want to validate that because it comes from somewhere, and then the next step is really to ask them about, like, what do you wish was different from your perspective? What do you, like, what's hard? What's difficult? What do you wish was different? And then you can start to make some recommendations there so that it does come from an empathetic, a helping perspective, as opposed to, like, I'm the expert here, right? Like, I know how to teach and you don't, even though this is somebody who's been teaching that subject for 20 years. I, if I come in with that attitude, they will literally never listen to a single thing that I have to say, right? You have to honor the experience that people have and then come in as somebody who is, no, I don't know anything about accounting. I do know a thing or two about learning, though. So let's, let's talk about that. And when you're thinking about, so I can give you some perspective, like in the industry, and as we call them, SMEs, subject matter experts, that name always made me giggle. Um, when they come to learning and development specialists uh, for, you know, their experience as maybe they're doing training or on the job training. And I have worked with companies that train frontline workers and now had to train frontline workers, maybe more in an online e-learning environment. And some of them do come to learning and development specialists because, you know, they are the subject matter experts, but that doesn't make them an expert or great in teaching it and delivering that. So I do find like sometimes, yes, it's building that rapport. And it was always building the rapport uh, with the clients understanding that. But also, I think coming from the hopeful and optimistic perspective for some of the subject matter experts, they are there to be like, help us. Please let us know, let us in on the secrets of cognitive science because they don't have access to the journals. They don't have time to read a 30 page paper and translate some of that science. So I feel like that's kind of our job to do that in these kind of roles and spaces is translate some of that. And I think I was just talking to Carl earlier that I was saying, even the language that we use, you know, we might not bring in cognitive science principle. They talk about brain science. And I always worked with clients and asking, you know, like, okay, let's maybe do some things that work with our brains, not against our brains. So what are some of those things? So it's also thinking about the language that you're using with the subject matter experts. And we're I think take, we have time for a question. We're gonna take one last question. Chris. Thanks, Irina and Amy, great presentation. Thank you. Um, I guess kind of picking up off the last question, we've talked about the important role of the subject matter expert, and we've talked about the important role of you as kind of learning designers, educational developers. Um, have you thought about what the role of including students in the course design process might look like? Um, and I know that you talked about like collecting iterative feedback along the way, um, but I'm wondering like inviting students into that course design process earlier on, um, and if you do that, what does that look like? Yes. Thank you <laughs> Can I for start? that question, Thank you. please. We yeah. didn't ask him to ask this. So actually last year at Steli, uh, when we went, it was a great conference ending that the, the students who had won awards gave these beautiful speeches and their main tagline on the slide was nothing for us without us. And that is something that we highly employ. So even within our team and thinking about that and coming back from the conference, we applied for funding to get student colleagues on our team. So now we do have permanent roles for, study, for work study students and for students to work with us and also have done that and have tried to do that in our experiences within DeGroote School of Business of getting the students to work with us and getting them early in the process, as you mentioned. Because yes, we love to do the course refinements and we usually do give them with the instructors, they're all anonymous, we give them tips and what they can do afterwards with those. But involving students, that's why involving the learners as your co-creators, it's so valuable because, you know, 
I'm, I like to think that I'm still very young, but I don't know what an undergraduate student is facing. I don't know what they're feeling, what's happening in the world. Just talking to some of my friends about, you know, like rent in Hamilton and having to live here to go for school. So having those perspectives from your students is extremely important because as Amy and I were also chatting, you know, we might implement some things, but three, four years from now, the environment will look different. It will be different. So bringing them in as our co-creators will really inform something that's working for them. Yeah, thank you for that question. Thanks, Irina. I think we try to include students at every stage. So we include a student in typically in our consultations with um, instructors or uh, staff who are gonna be leading a learning experience. We, um, we have students go through like pilots or prototypes for things. We have students uh, with us as we're sort of going through the design pieces. They start to learn more about our learning management system. And when they see what a learning management system can do, they're like, oh, and so why does the content just look like a Dropbox folder normally then? So once they can see what's possible, they start feeding ideas to us that they may not have thought of beforehand and we may not have thought of. Like sort of this, the sum of the parts is, is no, something not this, great Yeah, it's bigger than the whole. Something like that. It's the end of the day. Psychology. <laughs> something psychology. about psychology. Science, everyone. Yes. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Amy. And